In the long annals of human history, many empires have left an indelible mark both in the popular memory and the historical record. Empires like the Roman Empire, the Mongol Empire, the Chinese dynasties, or the Persian Empire. But for every empire whose name you recognized, many other great empires rose and fell and largely faded from popular memory. And yet, in their relative obscurity are still important links in the history of humankind. And one such empire was the Kingdom of Aksum, otherwise known as the Empire of Ethiopia, which flourished at the same time as Rome and Byzantium and became an important center of trade between those empires and empires in India, Sri Lanka, and the Far East, and also played an interesting role in the three major monotheistic religions of the Middle East. The Kingdom of Aksum deserves to be remembered. The kingdom of Aksum flourished in the 1st century AD to about the 7th century. Its center was the city of Aksum, located in the highlands of northern Ethiopia. The kingdom had its roots in the so-called Proto-Aksumite period, beginning about the 4th century BC, and became a force to be reckoned with by the 1st century AD. By that time, it was widely known as an excellent market for ivory, tortoise shells, and rhino horns, as recorded in the Greco-Roman Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, a kind of traveler's handbook that covered trading opportunities in the Red Sea and beyond, as far as southwestern India. The kingdom's earliest years are the subject of some scholarly debate, but it is known that the kingdom's written language, Gez, is a member of the Semitic family of languages, mostly centered in the Middle East. Other Semitic languages include Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, and Akkadian. Gez is no longer a spoken language, but it is used widely as the liturgical or holy language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, as well as other Ethiopian and Eritrean churches. The language may have been brought over by southern Arabic people in the 8th century, but some linguistic evidence suggests Semitic languages were spoken in the Horn of Africa for millennia. The value of this early script is significant. The biblical book of Enoch survives as a complete text only in Gez, and Ethiopian translations of the Bible are among the oldest surviving in the world. In its early years, the growing wealth from trade at its port city of Adulis allowed the kingdom to expand its influence over a large part of modern Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. The kingdom owes its growth to a shift in global trade patterns. Overland routes to India and other routes became less popular when traders learned that they could take advantage of monsoon winds to cross the Arabian Sea to India. The volume of trade that came through the Red Sea ballooned and brought enormous wealth and prosperity to traders along the route. Aksum would become the principal supplier of African goods to Rome. The kingdom subjugated a number of tribes in modern-day Somalia and extended some kind of dominance across the Red Sea over Himyar in modern-day Yemen. Conquered tribes were allowed some autonomy, but were required to pay tribute to Aksum, often in the form of heads of cattle, according to Aksumite inscriptions. As the kingdom became an empire, the Aksumite kings took on the title of Nagusa Nagast, or King of Kings. Whether this reflected a system of sub-kings is not yet clear. By the mid-4th century, Aksum was at its height. It was in that century that the kingdom began using the name Ethiopia, according to inscriptions. It was also in that century that Aksum played a role in the decline of the once powerful kingdom of Kush. Kush was a Nubian kingdom that had, for a time, installed pharaohs that ruled over a combined Egyptian Kushite kingdom. By the 4th century, Kush was a shadow of its former self, and a dispute led the Aksumite king, Izana, to attack and possibly sack the capital of Meroe. The kingdom of Aksum is possibly most famous for its enormous stele, large decorated obelisk like columns that had been built in the region for centuries. Hundreds of the monuments surround the city of Aksum today in steely fields, many of them marking the sites of underground burial chambers. The three largest of these, called the Royal Stele, are the 79-foot-tall Azana Stele, the fallen 108-foot-tall Great Stele, and the so-called Obelisk of Aksum. The Aksumites left a monument at Maroe and built another at Aksum to document Azana's victories, including that over the Kushites. The stone had writing on it in Gez, Sabian, and Greek thus representing a Rosetta Stone for these languages. King Azana ruled from the 320s to 356. Azana was the first Aksumite king to embrace Christianity, being converted sometime between 325 and 328. He advocated for Christianity in his own kingdom, less than two decades after the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great converted. The conversion of Ethiopia was, according to tradition, the responsibility of a single man. From Mencius of Tyre, According to the Roman historian Terenius Rufinius, as children, Frumentius and his brother went with their uncle on a ship to the Red Sea, where the crew was attacked and killed 
by pirates, because don't all good stories involve pirates? And the boys taken captive. They were given to the king of Aksum, Mazana's father, as slaves, but gained favor with the king before his death and were freed. Izana's mother begged them that they stay, as Izana was too young to rule, and she needed help teaching him and managing the kingdom. When Izana took the throne, Frumentius was an important advisor to the kingdom. Frumentius traveled to Alexandria to talk to the bishop there, who consecrated him bishop and promised to assist him in Aksum's conversion. On his return, he baptized the king, and shortly after founded the original Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum, a rebuilt version of which still stands today. This became the site where Ethiopian emperors and later emperors of Abyssinia were crowned. The Ethiopian church enjoyed significant autonomy, but did follow the church in Alexandria to split from the Roman church following disagreements after the Council of Chalcedon in 451. The kingdom began minting its own currency during the reign of the king Indubis at the end of the 3rd century, and continued minting coins for 400 years. They were one of the only ancient states in sub-Saharan Africa to mint their own currency, and one of only four in the world who were minting gold coins at the time. Izana began minting coins bearing the Christian cross, one of the earliest examples of the symbol on coins. The relative abundance of Aksumite coins indicates that the kingdom had access to large supplies of gold, although it is uncertain what the kingdom's sources were. Aksumite coins are also notably pure, and the supply of metals was closely controlled by the Aksumite state. The kingdom's trade and influence was great. Aksumite coins have been found as far afield as India and Sri Lanka. The next major expansion was under King Caleb in the 6th century. Caleb was recognized as a Christian by the Byzantine Emperor Justin I, who sought Caleb's assistance in ending atrocities committed by the Himerite king against Christians in modern-day Yemen. Caleb defeated and killed the Himerite king, and the kingdom remained a tributary under the Aksumite general Abraha and his son Masruk. Masruk's brother revolted with the help of the Sassanid Persian Empire, leading to a series of wars that were eventually won by the Persians. Munro Hay, a modern historian, cites these wars as one of the factors in the kingdom's collapse, thanks to the war's cost and loss of prestige. The kingdom's decline was caused by many factors. In addition to strength loss fighting the Persians, the kingdom may also have been affected by the plague of Justinian, probably the first appearance of bubonic plague, which killed millions in other parts of the world. In the early 7th century, the growing dominance of the Islamic Empire in the region isolated the country from other Christian states and largely ended their trading empire. But unlike Christian Europe, Aksum was not on bad terms with its Islamic neighbors. Muhammad began preaching publicly in 610, but the ruling tribe of Mecca persecuted his followers. In the middle 610s, Muhammad advised his adherents, including his daughter, to seek refuge in Aksum, in an episode known as the First Hijra. The king of Aksum is said to have refused a Meccan delegation, which sought their return. There are different accounts of the effects of the exile, with some Islamic accounts suggesting that local Aksumites embraced Islam, while some Ethiopian accounts instead suggest that some of the exiles converted to Christianity. Other ancient Christian kingdoms, such as Nobatia, Mercuria, and Elodia, to the northeast, would eventually become Islamic, but Aksum and its successors remained Christian. Despite their relationship with Islam, as early as 640, attacks were made at the port of Adulis, and the kingdom was forced to abandon the city of Aksum and retreat inland. This marked the end of the kingdom's trading empire. However, the kingdom remained formidable and continued to expand south for several centuries. According to Ethiopian tradition, the kingdom was conquered by a Jewish queen named Judith in the 10th century, but contemporary scholars doubt whether she was really Jewish. Still, there is evidence of burned churches and rule by a female usurper in contemporary documents. Another factor in the kingdom's decline might have been climatological. With the collapse of the trading empire, there was over-farming on the terraced hillsides, which led to an erosion crisis that cascaded into a food shortage. And the, the favorable rainy season seems to become less reliable in the 9th and 10th centuries. The kingdom collapsed completely by 960, replaced by the kingdom ruled by the local Agawa people called the Zagwe dynasty, which lasted until 1270. It was overthrown by Yakuno Amlak, who claimed to be descended from a survivor of Judas' purge. Additionally, during this new Ethiopian empire, the Kebra Nagast, or Glory of Kings, was compiled and written, and considered to be a reliable historical work by the Ethiopian church. The work is a national epic describing the fandom of Aksum, containing the genealogy of the kings of Aksum, and the story of how the Ethiopians stopped worshipping the sun and moon to worship the Lord God of Israel. The bulk of the work tells the story of the biblical Queen of Sheba, whom it identifies as Makeda of Ethiopia. As told in the Bible, she visits King Solomon in Israel and is impressed by the wealth and knowledge there. 
but it then breaks from the biblical narrative by stating that she and Solomon conceived a child. The son, Menelik, visited his father as an adult, but refused to remain in Israel, so Solomon sent the firstborn children of the nation's elders with him to Ethiopia. Upset with their lot, these sons stole the Ark of the Covenant, and thanks to divine intervention, escaped Solomon's agents. It weaves together a narrative that the kings of Aksum and later Ethiopia were a single line descended from Solomon as far back as 900 BC, and the Ethiopian church still claims the Ark is in their possession at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. Modern scholarship on the work is lacking, but there is a possibly ancient Jewish population in Ethiopia known as the Beta Israel. Their origin remains uncertain, and even oral tradition suggests several possibilities. Many of them have in the modern era immigrated to Israel. In the 1930s, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia led to Italian soldiers taking one of the three royal stele, the one called the Obelisk of Axum, in five pieces to Rome as a trophy, where it was erected under the orders of Benito Mussolini. It was kept there until its repatriation finally began in 2003. The pieces were so large that only the Anatov 124, a Russian plane, could carry it, among other difficulties. It has been reconstructed and now stands in its original home at Axum. The Solomonic dynasty was removed from power in 1974, and today the once great kingdom of Aksum and its ruins are spread throughout several modern states. Its name is barely remembered, its modern influence is obscure. But in its time it was mighty. The Persian philosopher Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, described it as one of the four great powers of his time, with the others being Rome, Persia, and China. And of course, of that list, the kingdom of Axum is the one that is far least remembered today. But it, the important role that it played in the development of some of the world's great religions and its once powerful trading empire give it a unique role in history that deserves to be remembered. But there's still so much we don't know, many questions still unanswered. And the, the, the forgotten history of the kingdom of Axum reminds us of the enduring complexity of world politics and how much history there still is out there yet to be uncovered. Around 1235 AD, on the banks of the Niger River, a great battle was fought between two successor states of the fallen Ghanan Empire, and victory in that battle would give rise to an empire that would last 400 years. One of the wealthiest empires in history would eventually, at its height, cover 500,000 square miles and include tens of millions of people. And yet, because this occurred in pre-colonial Africa, we have very little record. Just oral history, that thin reed that connects us to a nearly forgotten past and tells us of a great battle that spawned a magnificent empire. History that deserves to be remembered. While there are some scattered records of the Malian Empire, the story of the battle that birthed the empire exists only in a poem told by the Grio, the storytellers of West Africa, the African versions of Homer, in the great epic poem, the Sundiata Keita. According to the poem, the king, Magum the Handsome, was visited by a soothsayer who told him that if he would marry an ugly woman, that she would bear him a son who would one day be a great king. When two hunters offer Magan a woman so ugly that they call her the Buffalo Woman because of the hunch in her back, the king remembers the soothsayer and takes her as his second wife, and she bears him a son, Sundiata. But when the king dies, it is the son from his first wife that becomes king, and he is so jealous of Sundiata that he mistreats Sundiata and his family, and Sundiata, his mother and sisters, are forced to go into exile. But in exile, Sundiata grows to be a great hunter and strong as a lion. But the king of another kingdom, Sama Oro of the Soso, described as an evil sorcerer, attacks his brother's kingdom and drives his brother into exile. And the people cry for the return of the exiled prince, Sundiata. Sundiata manages to gather together the armies of several smaller tribes and confronts Samaoro in battle, and in the battle defeats Samaoro with a poisoned arrow. He then goes and conquers Sosa and founds a great empire, being given the title Mansa, or King of Kings. 
Now the poem is full of symbolism, but what we can divine from the poem and what we know from other histories is that in the wake of the collapse of the Ghanan Empire, sometime around the middle of the 12th century, a kingdom called Soso started expanding. And in 1205, a king named Sama Ora came to power in Sosa and started raiding throughout West Africa. Now in 1234, an exiled prince from a much smaller kingdom called the Kaniaga led a, a coalition of city-states to retake his kingdom, and then in 1235 to lead the combined armies in a battle against Samaoro called the Battle of Karina. Samaoro is defeated and he disappears, possibly killed in the battle, but Sundiata continues on to defeat Sosa and found the Great Empire of Mali. It is difficult to overstate how extraordinary this new empire was. Governed as a confederation of kingdoms where multiple kingdoms got to select their representatives to the high king's court, it would eventually cover more than a half million square miles. All of West Africa from south of the Sahara Desert to the rainforest, including the great highway of commerce, the river Niger. East to west, it went from the coast to the great bend in the river, so large that it said that if you started walking from the coast, you would walk eight months before leaving the empire. In its day, it was only exceeded in size by the great Mongol Empire. And it was unbelievably rich. It had copper mines. It was the end of the salt caravan trade, but it had gold mines so rich that nearly half of the gold in the old world came from those Malian gold mines. When the king of Mali went on the Hajj, the, the great pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324, he spent so much gold that he devalued currency throughout the continent. He was, by some calculations, the wealthiest person in all of history. And among all of its other things, the great kingdom included the huge city of learning and trade called Timbuktu, larger than London in its day. Perhaps the most extraordinary tale of the Mali Empire was the King Abu Akari II, who in 1310 was so curious about what was on the other side of his western shore that he gave up his throne and took a fleet of 4,000 ships to try to cross the ocean and see what was on the other side nearly 200 years ahead of Columbus, and there is some circumstantial evidence that he might have made it to the Americas, although historians are skeptical on the subject. The Great Malian Empire was the first of the West African empires to draw the attention of both Europe and the Islamic world, and through its extensive trade it impacted not just the whole African continent, but all of the known world with its art and its architecture and its amazing wealth. And while the empire would start to decline by the end of the 14th century, the empire would still be around clear till the middle of the 1600s. And yet, because this empire came in the pre-colonial era, we don't know much about it. Records were only kept as oral histories, and pre-colonial Africa is both understudied and much of its history was destroyed by the impacts of colonialism. And that is too bad, because the story of the great Battle of Karina, fought by the Lion King Sundiata to found the amazing Malian Empire, is history that deserves to be remembered. While Europe was in the Middle Ages, across the world on the Yucatan Peninsula, the Mayan civilization was in its prime. While most of the pre-contact Mayan history was destroyed by the Spanish invaders, there are a few stories that we can tease out of the remaining texts, and one of those is the rise of a particular group of Maya called the Itza, and their long and influential history in the area. They ruled from their mighty city of Chichen Itza, which is today one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in the Yucatan and they were the last of the Maya to capitulate to the Spanish invaders, 150 years after the rest of the Maya civilization had collapsed. The rise, the magnificent civilization, and the eventual fall of the Itza is a, a, an epic tale, the Beowulf or Gilgamesh of Mesoamerica. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The Mayan civilization, unlike the nearby Aztec or Incan civilizations, was itself never an empire or ruled by a single leader. 
Instead, the Maya were bound culturally and linguistically, but were made up of numerous ethnic groups and tribes, and were, in general, ruled by more powerful city-states or local lords. The political patchwork nature of the Mayan civilization played a large part in their history. One of these groups, called lineages, houses, or tribes, was the Itza. It isn't known for sure when or where the Itza originated, but it seems that they arrived in the Yucatan at the end of the Maya Classic period, around 900 AD. They may have come from the southern Mayan highlands, modern-day Guatemala and Honduras, migrating during the massive collapse that marked the end of the Classic Mayan period. In all the narrative sources we have for the Maya, the Itza seem to be specifically a people apart. They were feared and hated by other Mayan groups, and called those who speak our language brokenly. They seem to have had unique customs, and were also called rogues and disrespectful of their elders. Spanish friar André de Avendano says that they beheaded men over 50, so that they shall not learn to be wizards and to kill. When they arrived in the Yucatan, they settled at a site of a smallish town called Ukbalam. The name has not been positively deciphered, but possible translations include seven great rulers, seven great houses, and seven bushy places. Shortly after they set up control of the city, it became known as Chichen Itza, a name meaning at the mouth of the well of the Itza, probably referring to the great water-filled sinkhole known as the sacred Senate. The lowlands of the Yucatan have no rivers or lakes, and said they have sinkholes that offer access to one of the most complex systems of underground caves and rivers in the world. Under the hegemony of the Itza tribe, Chichen Itza became the most important center of the Mayan lowlands. The former centers of Kaba and Yashua were on the decline, and the Itza were able to fill the gap. At its height, Chichen Itza held sway almost over the entire Yucatan Peninsula. The city controlled a port on the north coast called the Isla Cerritos, and through it, the Itzas became the important players in trade up and down the coast. Especially valuable in trade was their control of the natural salt resources, and they traded for jade, gold, pottery, and obsidian. This was the height of Chichen Itza's dominance, a city of possibly as many as 50,000 people. It was during this time that the greatest construction took place at the site. Possibly the most famous structure of the city stands over the carefully flattened ground of the city and dominates the ruins, the Temple of Kukulkan. The Mayan word for the snake serpent god, Quetzalcoatl. Also known as El Castillo, or the castle, the large step pyramid is a marvel of architecture. Designed as a major ceremonial center, it is perfectly positioned to provide natural amplification for speakers standing atop it. The pyramid was built to be a physical representation of the Mayan calendar. Each side of the pyramid has 91 steps, with the last one leading into the temple at the top, representing each of the 365 days in a year. The nine levels, bisected by stairways on each side, represent the 18 months of the Mayan calendar. Perhaps most impressively, on the equinoxes each year, the light hits the pyramid in a way that creates the winding image of a snake on the stairway, which slowly descends with the sun to represent Kukul Khan's descent from the sky to the underworld. Signs of Chichen Itza's wealth are even now present in the ruins of the site. The temple of Kukul Khan lies atop a second temple, and within the tower's temple's main chamber lies a jaguar throne, studded with valuable jade and shells. At its peak, the temples were painted with brilliant colors, very little of which remains today. Chichen Itza is also home to the largest ball court in Central America. The ball game played by Mesoamerican cultures was unique among ancient sports in that it was played by many different cultures across a vast space. Over 1,300 ball courts have been found, stretching across time from 1400 BC to contact with the Europeans. The ball court at Chichen Itza dwarfs any other yet discovered, 550 by 230 feet. Its walls are decorated with detailed depictions of players. The sheer size of the field was a statement of the oversized wealth and power of the city in the post-classic period. Another symbol of the Itza's wealth at their height is the enormous Temple of the Warriors, and beside it, the Thousand Columns. Some of the columns in front of the Warrior Temple are carefully decorated with depictions of individuals, and no two of them are the same. These may have represented trophies of captured foes, as well as paintings of particularly famous or renowned soldiers of the city. Two more, much smaller ball courts stand within the complex. Just north of the city lies the great sacred Senate, an important and sacred ceremonial site, where the Maya threw offerings, including human sacrifices, to their deities. Archaeologists dread the Senate in the 1920s, and found that the people sacrificed here seemed to have come from all over the Mesoamerican region. Sometime during their reign, the Itzas became associated with the Toltecs. 
The arrival of the Toltecs traditionally separates Old Chitsen, a complex of smaller temples and edifices in the Mayan Puic style, and New Chitsen, the site of the ball court, El Castillo, and the Temple of the Warriors, which have Toltec styles. The Toltecs have a complex place within Mesoamerican archaeology. They have traditionally been remembered as a warlike people who ruled an empire from the city of Tula, and their king was called Quetzalcoatl, or Kukulkan, after the Mesoamerican god. Much of the history of the Toltecs we have comes specifically from Aztec sources, who revered the Toltecs as an ideal society. Sometime during the reign of the Itzas, the Toltecs became involved with Chichen Itza, which is evident in the Toltec style of the later and larger monuments. Early literature theorized the city had been conquered by the Toltecs, but modern studies has brought this idea into question. Despite the Toltec influence on the architecture, archaeologists emphasize that Chichen Itza is neither uniquely Mayan nor uniquely Toltec, but is an active blend of ideas from the central Mexican area and traditional Mayan concepts. The, the Mayan relationship with the Toltecs is still a matter of interpretation. And in fact, some scholars suggest that the Aztec description of the Toltecs is so tangled in myth that the Toltecs might not really have existed as described at all. Sometime during their time in the Yucatan, the Itza are said to have abandoned Chichen Itza to found a city of Shakanpudum. This foray into the wilderness of the Yucatan may have lasted over 200 years, although its veracity is uncertain. They were eventually chased out of Shakanpudum, apparently by another group of Itza, according to the chronicles. After that, they lived for 40 years under the trees in ash and poverty. They eventually returned to Chichen Itza in the 10th century. While the Maya had many written histories, during the Spanish conquest much of what was left behind was systematically and deliberately destroyed. Only a few late Maya texts survive, in which the coalescing indigenous and Spanish traditions combine to present a muddled memory of Mayan history. One of these is the Chilam Balam, the name representing an author, Chilam meaning priest and Balam meaning jaguar. Among the miscellaneous Mayan and Spanish parts of the text, it also relates the story of the decline and fall of Chichen Itza. Sometime around the turn of the millennium, the Mayan ruler, Amakat Tutulxiu, founded what historians call the League of Mayapan, an alliance between Chichen Itza, Uxmal, and Mayapan. Diego de Landa, a Spanish bishop involved in the destruction of much of the Maya codices, wrote that Mayapan was founded by valorous captains of the Itza, while Uxmal was formed by another Mayan tribe, the Shu. Of the three cities, Chichen Itza was the largest, most important. The League of Mayapan effectively ruled the entire peninsula, but was beset by internal and external conflict. What little we know about Chichen Itza's fall is entwined with oral history and myth, and comes from a handful of the Chilam Balam books, especially the one found at the city of Mani. The narratives are fragmentary and have been described as incoherent, but parts of the story can be understood. Gives the date that the head chief of the Chichen Itza was driven out because of the treachery of Hunak Sail, and the city was depopulated. What precisely this treachery was is a mystery. Involved was definitely the city of Ushmal, Chok Sib Chok, a possibly mythical king of Chichen Itza, and Hunak Sale, leader of the city of Mayapan. Hunak Sale's origin is unknown, but one story we have from his life is that he survived being thrown into the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza. Many people were thrown into the cenote as part of ritual sacrifices, but there was a custom that if someone survived, they would be pulled or would climb from the cenote to give a prophecy about the upcoming year. Hunak Sale, possibly as a prisoner, was thrown into the cenote, and the following day gave a prophecy. Amash Kuk, leader of the Chichen Itza, then helped Tere Sale to become leader of Mayapan. The events leading up to Hunak Sale's treachery are even foggier. In a tale reminiscent of the Greek legend of Troy, a prince of Chichen Itza stole another's wife, precipitating the war. A telling of this story survived the conquest. San Nyat, or White Flower, was a princess meant to be married to Al Uli El, a prince of Ushmal. But the princess had fallen in love with Khan Eik, or Black Serpent, a prince of Chichen Itza, who on her wedding day brought his warriors to the festivities and stole her away. To avenge, A Uli El and Hunak Sail raised a band of warriors from central Mexico. Seven men is named in the Chilam Balam, and with them sought to destroy Chichen Itza. But when Hunak Sail arrived, the Itza had already fled ahead of him. It isn't clear if there was a fight or if the city was sacked. There is some evidence that the city was sacked near this time, but some scholars have suggested Chichen Itza had ceased to be an important center decades before Mayapan rose to prominence. 
The Itza were said to have gone into the heart of the forest of Tashu Lukmul, near Lake Patain. The Itza were still at Lake Patain 400 years later, when they told Spanish priests they had come from Chichen Itza. Mayapan then took over undisputed control of the peninsula and remained in power for another 250 years, until further infighting brought down the League of Mayapan entirely in the mid-1400s. Chichen Itza remained an important ceremonial and pilgrimage site even after the conquest. Though they did not call themselves Itza, likely Itza descendants helped to fight tenaciously against the Spanish before the Yucatan was subdued in the 1540s. Mayapan itself, sometimes called the last great city of the Maya, was built to mimic the great city. It too has a temple of Kukulkan, similar to El Castillo, though much smaller. At its height, it may have been a city of 12,000 people. In Patain, where the ethnically Itza Maya live today, the Itza founded a city called Noje Patan, meaning Great Island, unlike Patain. The Spanish called it Tayasal, a corruption of Tai Itza, meaning Place of the Itza, and today it is known as Flores, Guatemala. While they remained busy building an empire of 230,000 square kilometers inside under four different kingdoms subordinate to the Itza, which was at its height when Cortes landed in 1519. After the Battle of Sintla, shortly after the landing, the Itza sent Cortes several princesses as an offering of peace, and one of these princesses, Malin Tsin, would play a role in the fall of the Aztec Empire. The Itza were an embattled empire during the conquest as the Spanish encroached on the kingdoms. Cortes executed the last Aztec king while he was traveling through Itza territory in 1523, and he celebrated mass at Noje Patin with Khan Ek that December. After the fall of most of the Mayan world in the 1540s, the Itza remained independent and steadfastly refused to submit to Spanish rule or to convert to Catholicism. The heavily forested and remote nature of the Patan area contributed to the Itza's continued independence as the rest of pre-colonial Mesoamerica fell one after the other to Spanish rule. They defeated the Spanish armies and to conquer them in 1622 by ambush. And as late as 1696, Spanish priests preached peacefully to the last Itza king at Noje Patan. But in 1697, a Spanish army under Martin de Ursa, governor of the Yucatan, came to the city and officially forced the Itza to submit to Spanish rule. There was a short fight, but the use of an ore-powered attack boat caused heavy casualties and forced the Itza to surrender. They were one of the last indigenous cities to be conquered, 150 years after the Spanish conquered the Yucatan. The story of the Itza is one of greatness, of decline, of tenacity. In the ever-changing political landscape of Mayan culture, they managed to cling to an extraordinary amount of power for more than a thousand years. And while much of their history has been lost or destroyed or mythicized, what remains is the story of a determined and crafty people who have indelibly left their mark upon this earth. Their famous pyramid at Chichen Itza, connected with the perhaps now infamous Mayan calendar, has become a famous icon of their people. Today only a few thousand ethnic Itza survive, and only a few of those still speak the language, a version of Maya, perhaps as few as a dozen still speak it fluently. Their great city of Chichen Itza had already been abandoned by the time the Spanish arrived in the Americas, and by 1588 it was being used as a cattle ranch. American explorer John Lloyd Stevens published a book with illustrations of the city in 1843, which would lead more explorers and later photographs of the overgrown ruins. In the long time since, much of the site has been excavated. The Great Cenote has been dragged for Mayan artifacts, and parts of the site have been restored. It is now one of the most popular archaeological sites to visit in Mexico. It received 2.5 million visitors in 2017. In 2007, Chichen Itza was voted one of the new wonders of the world. The Itza and their once magnificent civilization are literally etched in the stone there and in the minds of the millions of people who now come to see the city that they left behind. The name China traveled down the Silk Road in antiquity and eventually came to be used as the name for the large nation that covered most of the eastern coastline of Asia. The name China was probably derived from the name of a single ancient Chinese dynasty, that of the Qin, whose brief rule over a unified China marked the beginning of the age of imperial China. The Qin dominance over other Chinese states, though years in the making, was accomplished in just nine years under a single king known today as Qin Shi Huang and the rise to power of the first emperor of China, 
deserves to be remembered. The Zhou dynasty gained power around 1046 BC after overthrowing the previous Shang dynasty. Though the Zhou became the longest lasting dynasty in Chinese history, after about 300 years their actual power began to decline. Local warlords took power over tiny fiefdoms and the Zhou were helpless to stop it. The kingdom eventually coalesced into seven major Chinese states by the 5th century BC. Known as the Warring States period, the Zhou held little power and could do nothing to stop their subjects from fighting amongst themselves. Many famous Chinese lived during this tumultuous time, such as Lao Tzu, Confucius, and Sun Tzu. The future Qin Shi Huang was born around 259 BC to Prince Yi Yan of the Kingdom of Qin. At the time, the prince was being held by the Zhou state as a political prisoner meant to ensure peace between the two states. Yi Yan was only a minor prince and son of the heir apparent Lord Angu and a concubine, but Angu had no legitimate sons to his wife. In fact, Angu was only the heir apparent because his long-lived father, the Bright King, still ruled and had outlived Angu's older brother. Yi Yan stood little chance of becoming king. Enter the merchant Lu Bu Wei. According to the records of the Grand Historian, Bu Wei saw in Yi Yan an opportunity for advancement in power. He convinced Yi Yan to begin a campaign of flattery meant to endear him to Anju's wife, the Lady of the Glorious Sun. Eventually the two convinced her to ask her husband to recognize Yi Yan as her adopted son and his heir. Angu agreed. The birth of the first emperor has been marred throughout history by an accusation that he was not the legitimate heir. According to the records of the Grand Historian, Yi Yan's wife was a courtesan named Zhao Zhi. Zhao Zhi had been a concubine of Lu Bu Wei. Bu Wei gave up Zhao Zhi, who took up with Yi Yan, but not before, according to the historian, becoming pregnant with Bu Wei's child. That accusation has been repeated uncritically by later writers, but it actually wasn't written until more than a hundred years after the emperor's death, written by a dynasty that was actively hostile towards the memory of the first emperor. So it might be nothing more than political slander. The prince was given the name Yin Zhang. When Zhang was two, his great-grandfather, the Bright King, attacked Zhou, where Yi Yan and his family were still prisoners. Yi Yan was sentenced to death, but escaped when a servant disguised himself as the prince, while Bu Wei and Yi Yan slipped out the city. The Bright King was also responsible for the end of the Zhou. The Zhou made a preemptive attack to stave off an impending invasion, but the Qin pushed it back and defeated the Zhou King, who died in their custody shortly thereafter. They seized eight of the nine tripod cauldrons, seen as symbols of the Mandate of Heaven. The last flew away before they could capture it. Qin scholars wrote that, Nowadays the house of Zhou has been destroyed. The line of the sons of heaven has been severed. There is no greater turmoil than the absence of the son of heaven. The bright king died in 251 BC after ruling for 57 years. Lord Angu was crowned, but died just three days later. He is generally thought to have died of old age or illness, but conspiracy can't be ruled out. Lu Bu Wei became Grand Counselor on the elevation of his protege, Yi Yan. But Yi Yan too died quickly after ruling for only three years. No explanation is given for his sudden death, but Bu Wei and his former lover, Zhao Zhi, became the regents of the 13-year-old Zhang. Bu Wei hired a scholar from the state of Chu called Li Si to teach Zhang, which he would later come to regret. Si was ambitious and, like Bu Wei, saw opportunity for advancement in Qin. Competition for power in the state was very real. Bu Wei deliberately delayed Zhang's manhood ceremony and distracted Zhao Zhi by introducing her to Lao Ai, who pretended to be a eunuch and had two secret sons with the Queen Dowager. Zhang was prevented from taking the throne when he turned 20, first by the sight of a tailed comet, considered the first certain record of Halley's Comet, and then by the death of his grandmother. When he was 22, Zhang visited the grave of his ancestor, the Warring Duke, who was famous for throwing out scheming ministers. Bu Wei could not have missed the symbolism and allowed Zhang to be crowned. Qin, though, was at a crossroads. One source said that in Qin, the question is always the same. Are you the Empress and Lao Ai's man, or Lu Bu Wei's? Lao Ai made his move after Zhang's coronation, using the Queen Dowager's signet ring to convince royal guards to follow his orders in an attempted coup. Zhang put the coup down, captured Lao Ai, and had him pulled apart by chariots. Ai's family was killed as well, including the secret sons. Zhou Zhi was put under house arrest, Bu Wei was replaced by Li Si, and shortly after, killed himself. 
Starting in 230 BC, Qin attacked and captured the weak state of Han. They then turned on to the state of Zhou, which they defeated by spreading rumors that the Zhou general was disloyal. The competent general was killed, and Zhou's lesser generals were defeated by the Qin. The kingdom of Yin was next on Qin's list. The heir apparent was Yin Din, also known as the Red Prince. The Red Prince feared for his kingdom and hired a man named Jing He to assassinate Zhang. He convinced a Qin general who had fled to Yin to commit suicide, so He could take his head to Zhang as a means of getting close. The Red Prince also gave He a map of Yin's defenses, with a thin knife rolled inside. The dagger was coated with a dangerous poison. He would only have to nick the king to kill him. Jing He succeeded in getting an audience with Zhang and brought a young boy to carry the map while He carried the box that contained the general's head. In the throne room, no one except the king was allowed to be armed, and no one was allowed on the king's dais without his express permission. As they approached him, the youth became so nervous that he froze. Jing He laughed it off, saying that the boy had never seen such splendor. He set aside the head and took the map himself. As Zhang unrolled the map, the knife was revealed. He grabbed the king's sleeve, but it tore and the king jumped backwards. Zhang struggled with his huge ceremonial sword while his paralyzed nobles looked on. They yelled for the guards who were outside the room. The king hid behind a pillar and finally yanked the sword free. He stabbed He in the thigh. He threw the dagger, but missed, hitting the pillar instead. Both Jing He and his accomplice were killed. Zhang was furious and he ordered his armies to attack Yin. Desperate for peace, the king of Yin had the Red Prince killed as an apology, which brought the kingdom a short reprieve before the Qin armies attacked again. Qin conquered the state of Wei next by destroying the dams that protected Wei's capital from flooding by the Yellow River. Only five years in, Qin's enemies had gone from six states to just two. Qin's next target was Shu, the largest of their foes. Shu surprised the first army that invaded, forcing Zhang to pull his best general out of retirement. After a series of battles, Shu fell in 222 BC, and only the state of Qi remained. Qin had already bribed the counselor of Qi to stay out of the earlier wars. Qi's armies were ill-prepared, but the Qin army bypassed them completely, arriving by surprise on the young king's doorstep. He surrendered without a fight. All six kings have been chastised as they deserved, Zhang said. All under heaven is brought to heel. In only nine years, Qin had become the sole power in China. To recognize his accomplishment, Zhang and his ministers came up with an entirely new title. They dug into Chinese myth and combined the term Huang, which referred to the mythical three sovereigns, and Di, which referred to the ancient five emperors, because now he had outshone even those legendary rulers. Huang Di came to being emperor, and Zhang changed his name to Qin Shi Huang Di, or first emperor of the Qin. He declared that his dynasty would last for 10,000 generations. Qin Shi Huang oversaw massive government reforms, aimed at keeping his disparate empire united. Li Si was the driving force behind his change. He thought that the tradition of empowering incompetent children and family was a mistake, and instead created 36 provinces run by government appointees who earned their jobs by merit. Defensive walls that had stood between the states were torn down, and the many northern fortifications were extended and reinforced into a single fortification, the first Great Wall of China. The Wien Wall was mostly made of rammed earth and used natural obstacles as often as possible. Coinage was standardized across the kingdom, as was a unit of gold. Hundreds of miles of road was built to support movement, trade, and tax collection. Perhaps most importantly, the Qin standardized and simplified Chinese writing across the empire, primarily so Qin's laws could be understood everywhere. They even standardized the length of axles, so all wagons would fit into the road's ruts. That wasn't to say that all was peaceful. Purges against those who had fought or disagreed with the Qin persisted. One man, Zhao Jian Li, had played a very minor role in Jing He's assassination attempt, and would have been killed except that he was a talented musician. He was blinded instead, but allowed to play before the emperor. Jian Li kept playing for the king until for one performance he was within arm's length. Taking his chance, he swung his instrument, which had been filled with lead. He was easily disarmed and killed. The Qin Empire was highly legalistic, with a complex system of laws that offered the wealthy many opportunities to pay in place of punishment in order to fill the kingdom's coffers. It was accepted policy to torture witnesses to uh, clarify their testimony. Neighbors were encouraged to implicate neighbors to reduce their own punishments or get paid. Mutilation was common, from cutting off noses and toes to punitive tattoos. Another punishment was hard labor to build the roads and the Great Wall. 
one writer called the Qin government the first police state in history. Like all rulers, Qin Shi Huang found that he was not immune to mortality. Already construction had begun on his enormous mausoleum, and the thought of his death troubled him greatly. A scholar claimed that beyond the eastern seas lay islands where the gods lived, and the emperor gave him a lavish budget to build a fleet and go find the secret to immortality. On one of his tours, the emperor faced his third assassination attempt. A disgruntled nobleman from a conquered state hired a strongman to throw a huge rock down a hill and smash the emperor's wagon. But they smashed the wrong wagon. Zhang retreated to his palace for safety. Later in his rule, Li Si convinced the emperor to destroy books that could lead his subjects to believe in a false golden age of the past and thus find discontent in their own lives. The emperor ultimately ordered many works destroyed, though copies of them were kept for the imperial. The most dangerous books were considered poetry, philosophy, and history books written in other states. Modern scholars think that the tale in the records might be exaggerated, but that some books were burned and that many more of them may have been destroyed after the fall of the dynasty. The emperor was still obsessed with finding immortality. He had a garden bill where he tried to lose himself in nature, and he built a huge network of tunnels that were meant to keep his whereabouts secret so he could attain enlightenment by divesting himself of earthly concerns. He had an army of alchemists and scholars researching immortality, but grew frustrated when he found that several of them were lying to him. He had hundreds interrogated, and he sought leads, and ultimately had 460 of them killed. Though this accusation, too, has faced modern scrutiny, as it isn't mentioned in any source but the hostile records. Frightened by what he felt were ominous omens, the emperor decided to take another tour of his empire. He brought Li Si, as well as his young 18th son, Hu Hai. He died on September 10th, 210 BC, of an unknown illness, possibly caused by a concoction meant to be an elixir of immortality that contained mercury. The emperor wrote to his eldest son, Prince Fusu, who had been exiled to the border, forgiving him and asking the boy to bury his father. Hu Hai's tutor, Zhao Gao, received the note and instead convinced Hu Hai to take the throne. Li Si was brought into the conspiracy and the three of them drafted a new letter for the eldest son. The letter reprimanded Fu Su for his failures and ordered him to commit suicide. Fu Su obeyed. The conspirators chose to hide the emperor's death until they could reach the safety of the capital. They allowed no one to see him and had a fish cart stationed nearby the wagon to mask the smell of the emperor's body. When they reached the capital, they announced the emperor's death and crowned Hu Hai, claiming the emperor had chosen him as successor. Zhao Gao led purges that targeted Hu Hai's siblings and anyone else loyal to the first emperor. Rebellions broke out all over China. Hu Hai had little control over armies and so ordered the thousands of laborers at his father's tomb to take up weapons and fight back an invading force. Li Si tried to direct the king but only found himself arrested and killed by Zhao Gao. Qin's armies fell apart without leadership, some even defecting. When Hu Hai finally tra tried to take control of the kingdom, Zhao Gao ordered royal guards to attack the emperor's estate, and Hu Hai was forced to kill himself. Zhao Gao made a new plant princeling king and publicly gave up any claim to control the other states, hoping that would be enough to save the kingdom. It seems that Gao had underestimated his princeling, however, and the young king took his first chance to stab and kill the minister. Only 46 days after he was crowned, the prince surrendered to the army of Lu Ben, who had once worked on the first emperor's tomb. Ben burned the Qin capital, including the imperial libraries, and left it to rot. Ben would soon become the first emperor of a new dynasty, the Han. Ben's dynasty was aggressively anti-Qin, but actually maintained many of the changes that the Qin instituted, and built a scholarly class to run the imperial government. It did loosen many of the strict legalistic practices of the Qin and focused heavily on the demonization of the former dynasty, which seems to have given Qin Shi Huang his poor historical reputation, although in the 20th century scholars had begun to rehabilitate the ancient emperor. For centuries it was believed that the emperor's tomb was lost or destroyed over the millennia, although artifacts of terracotta were common. It wasn't until 1974 that locals digging for a well found most of a terracotta figure, and that caught the attention of the ailing Chairman Mao. Today, the Terracotta Army, some 7,000 realistic soldiers arranged around the Emperor's Tomb are one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in China. The Emperor's Tomb itself seems to have been found, but not yet opened. Qin Shi Huang's 10,000-year empire in the end only lasted a couple of decades, and other emperors would rise and take China in different directions. But in many ways, the first emperor unified China in ways that it had never done before. And his reforms and changes not only solidified the empire, but set the groundwork for the modern nation-state of China today by emphasizing bonds of culture. 
Chin's rule was certainly not without controversy, and towards the end of his rule became so personally obsessed with finding immortality that he neglected all the things that he had built. But the, the empire that had so deftly used things like conspiracy and subterfuge and spying to rise to power was in the end brought down by those same activities, brought low by the competing ambitions of its ministers. But though its rule was only brief, the Qin dynasty had significant impacts on history and culture. World history would simply not be the same were it not for the emperor of the Terracotta Army. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>